You have a big presentation tomorrow. Instead of preparing for it like you know you should, you decide that you deserve some me time. And before you know it, you've spent the entire night playing Destiny. Guess what happens next? It's called self-sabotaging and we all do it to some extent. So let's take a look at how and why we do it. On the low end, we have self-handicapping. This is when you do something fairly small that hurts your chances at success. It's important to note that you're not doing it because it might lead to failure, you're doing it despite the fact that it might lead to failure. It's a small difference, but an important one. For example, drinking the night before taking a test. You don't drink with the intention of bombing your test tomorrow, but you drink knowing that it might cause that, and you accept that risk for some reason. Or maybe you have a big paper or video due tomorrow. And instead of working on it, you know that it won't take you that long, so you spend the night binge watching some YouTube series for the umpteenth time. And just like every single time before, you've waited until the last minute and have to rush. Maybe you do it so often that you named your fake production company after it. The thing is, we all do this to some extent. Whether you eat junk food before a race or hit the snooze button too many times in the morning. Why? To protect your self-esteem. It's a way to shift blame from yourself onto something else. I didn't fail the test because I didn't study. I was hungover. Sorry I was late this morning. Traffic was terrible. This video wasn't the best because I just didn't have time to edit. It protects your self-image because you're not the reason you failed. It's some external force. Now you may know deep down that it is your fault, but you're not going to tell anyone else else that, and over time you will convince yourself that it's not your poor time management skills or poor study habits. Again, you don't do these things in order to cause failure, but you do them knowing the risk in order to give yourself an out. So what about people who do it while knowing the risk and knowing that it might lead to failure? Well, we have a name for that masochistic personality disorder. Because of the sexual connotations of that word, there's been a recent shift to calling it self-defeating personality disorder. This is when someone on purpose avoids or undermines happiness and is drawn to situations that will cause unhappiness. There are eight criteria, and in order to have this disorder, you have to tick the box on at least five of them, and you don't do it as a result of depression or abuse. They're just part of your personality. Knowing better is not a clinical psychologist and cannot diagnose or treat any disorders. So let's get started. Chooses people in situations that lead to disappointment, failure, or mistreatment even when better options are clearly available. Prime example? Someone who only dates jerks. Doesn't matter how many times they've ended up with one or how many times they've been mistreated or disappointed, they find themselves in this situation over and over. They just seem to find themselves attracted to these people for some reason. Why? Well, there's the sympathy and attention argument, obviously, but when it comes to this disorder, it's because there is comfort in unhappiness. Joy is fleeting and uncertain. You never really know how long it's going to last, and you can't really force yourself to feel happy. But unhappiness? That lasts as long as you want it to, and you can force it. Or you find yourself attracted to unavailable people, whether they're married or they live thousands of miles away. You flirt with each other at work and text each other constantly. Why? Because it's safe. You can't really be rejected by someone who is unavailable in the first place. I mean, you can be, but it's not going to hurt as much because deep down you knew it was never going to happen anyway. It's a way to feel that little bit of happiness without getting too invested, all the while knowing it will probably lead to disappointment. But it doesn't have to be romantic. Maybe you have some friends who aren't exactly upright citizens, or maybe you have some bad habits that you know might get you fired or land you in jail. But you keep them anyway, knowing the risk. Rejects or renders ineffective the attempts of others to help them. Rejecting someone's help is pretty self-explanatory, but how would you render someone's help ineffective? Well, let's say that you're having trouble with an assignment and a friend offers to come over the night before it's due to help you. You guys spend several hours working on it together and the next day you don't turn it in because it doesn't feel right turning in something that wasn't your own work. You protected your conscience or whatever, negated their help, and set yourself up for failure all in one fell swoop. Congratulations? It doesn't necessarily have to be as convoluted as that. Whenever someone gives you worthwhile advice, you just dismiss it because they don't know the whole story. Or maybe you're diet buddies with someone and whenever you're alone, you eat junk food. Side note, if you're on a diet and you have a cheat day, you're also rendering everything ineffective, but deep down you know that already. Following positive personal events responds with depression, guilt, or a behavior that produces pain. Hey, I heard you just got a promotion at work. Congratulations. Yeah, I don't really deserve it though. I mean, they had to give it to someone, and I've been there long enough. 
It's gonna be a lot of work though. I don't know how I'm gonna handle it. I'm, I might just turn it down really. All three, depression, guilt, and self-sabotage all in the span of a few sentences. First, they minimize the achievement by saying that it really wasn't that hard or anyone could have done it. Then they feel bad about getting the achievement over someone else. This is where imposter syndrome fits in, by the way, where you feel like they made a mistake in giving you that promotion or that spot in graduate school. And then blow it all up by completely rejecting the achievement. You don't have to do all three, but they often come as a package. Why? Because again, happiness is uncertain. Depression is forever. Being the underdog and being sad is comfortable. Incites angry or rejecting responses from others, then feels hurt, defeated, or humiliated. Have you ever played the let's see how long it takes for them to text me first game with someone that you're dating or have a crush on? Yeah, there are no winners in that game. If they do text you first, meh. But if they don't, you are inviting rejection. Why would you do that? Because A, happiness is fleeting, but B, so that you can tell everyone that you know that you just can't find someone who's as into you as you are into them. You are self-sabotaging your own chances. Maybe they're just busy, or maybe they're taking your silence as a rejection, so they're distancing themselves in response. Either way, there are no winners here. Rejects opportunity for pleasure or is reluctant to acknowledge enjoying themselves. Hey, do you want to go see the Emoji Movie? All right, do you want to go see it? Uh, not really. Too bad, we're going anyway. There, wasn't that fun? Nah, it was all right. We all know people who are like this sometimes, but people with this disorder do it always. Nothing was ever fun, nothing is ever great. It was all right, it's fine. This all goes back to happiness being fleeting. So you never really want to admit that you were happy because it's like a wish. If you say it out loud, it might disappear or something. I understand how ridiculous this might sound to most of you, and some of you might experience this occasionally, but people with this personality type experience it constantly. Pleasure is uncomfortable. They want it, but it's actually kind of scary, so they seek out safer options or ways to distance themselves from that pleasure in order to protect their sense of self. Fails to accomplish tasks crucial to their personal objectives despite having demonstrated ability to do so. Remember that example I gave of a friend helping you with a paper and then you not turning it in? Well now, you're the friend. You spent all night helping your friend get their work done at the cost of your own. Or putting yourself in a position where you no longer have time to properly get yours done. Maybe you've procrastinated on making a video so much that while you still do have time to do it and on several occasions you have done a video in a single day, you just decide to tweet out that there isn't enough time to do it justice, so no video. Is uninterested in or rejects people who consistently treat them well. Do I really have to have an explanation for every single one of these? Engages in excessive self-sacrifice that is unsolicited by the intended recipients of the sacrifice. Self-sacrifice doesn't necessarily mean doing something as heroic as jumping on a grenade to save the rest of your platoon. It can be something as simple as always volunteering for the graveyard shift or always doing the awful chore. While you think that you're doing something noble for everyone, people just start to assume that you enjoy it, so they just give you the graveyard shift or expect you to do that chore. And now, you can play underdog. But it can also go as high as admitting to wrongdoings that you didn't do in order to protect someone else. It might get you fired or just written up, but in your mind it was a noble sacrifice. Or perhaps even admitting to crimes where nobody got hurt and nobody saw you do it and the cops wouldn't have found out if you didn't tell them, but in your mind you're doing the right thing. Most people would say keep your mouth shut. Don't do it again, but keep your mouth shut. No, I must. I simply can't live with this lie. What are you doing? You already feel bad. You're not gonna do it again. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Roll credits. But before we end this, you might have noticed that I took several jabs at myself during this video. This is called self-deprecation, and it's partially to be funny, but it's also another self-defense technique. It's something that almost all of us do, especially YouTubers. And I'm not saying that everything I make is quality. <laughs> Far from it. Because I never meet anyone at all. Why not make the most of that degree and catastrophically disappoint your parents by becoming a YouTuber? Firstly, it's a way to appear modest, but... Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it's a way to brush off any potential criticism and negative comments. You can't call me a loser if I already said I'm a loser. You can't call me fat if I constantly joke about the fact that I'm fat. Please note that calling me a loser or calling me fat hurts. Always. But it's also a deterrent to you. You're not going to bring it up since I already did. And even if you did, it's like 
Yeah, I know, that's why I joked about it. All of these are ways that we protect our self-esteem, our ego, and our emotional well-being. Yeah, being sad and depressed isn't fun, but going from happy to sad is even less fun, so there are some people who prefer to just stay down here rather than ride the roller coaster. And even if you don't take it to that extreme, you will do things to soften the blow of the eventual downhills, whether you're giving yourself an excuse for it or causing it on purpose. So the next time you're contemplating procrastinating on that paper or declining a party invite, or just one more episoding the night before a test, you'll know better. So what ways have you self-handicapped before? Let me know down in the comments, and don't forget to sabotage that subscribe button, because part one of the color episode might be next. Also be sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and join the conversation on the subreddit.